good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. Uh, to my left is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 update for August 31st, 2021. We're honoured to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Before I begin, as you know, Dr. Henry will be giving an update uh, on modelling with respect to COVID-19. I want to recognize that today is International Overdose Awareness Day. The coroner gave a six-month report for the first six months of uh, 2021 earlier today, and 1,011 people died due to our poison drug supply. And this requires, including, of course, 159, I believe, in the month of June. And this requires consistent and continuing action for individuals, take the steps you need to take to be safe in these times because the poison drug supply continues to affect our communities. And we need to do everything we can and continue to do to separate people from this poison supply by providing prescribed and safer options. And also, of course, uh, a path to recovery in our, uh, in our public health care system and access to public health care services. There's been an unprecedented effort to do that. That continues. That is at the centre of our action, the action of health authorities and of a wide range of people in BC every day. And I want to pay tribute to all those working in this area who are, who are involved in this work, both as advocates, as health care practitioners and as members of the public who are engaged in this issue on this day and, uh, and express my appreciation to all of them. The work continues. The effort is a, of singular importance and that public health emergency, that of the overdose crisis, is with us, continues to be with us and continues to require a significant government action. Today we'll be uh, providing a briefing on COVID-19 and it's my honour to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Before we begin, I also want to acknowledge International Overdose Awareness Day. It does not uh, go unnoticed to all of us um, that this is an ongoing crisis that uh, I have been involved in uh, for five, six years now, um, that we were making some good progress on. But we are in a different place now. And it's not that we can only deal with one crisis, it's that we have our overdose crisis the toxic drug supply that is taking too many of our friends, our brothers and sisters, our family, our colleagues. But we also have to deal with the pandemic that is not as well where we want it to be right now. And I'm going to give a quick update of where we are in terms of the, over or the, uh, the pandemic, uh, give you an update on the epidemiology and some of the modeling that we're looking at, and then we'll uh, some understanding of where we are now with regards to this. So to start with, uh, a familiar um, geographic representation of the case rates by local health area of residents of the case. So this is from August 15th to 21st of this year. And as we can see, we have low case rates in many parts of the province, but we have focal hotspots. And that has been what we've been seeing for the last couple of weeks across the province, including uh, in one of the the encouraging things to see is the very low case rates that we continue to see in the Lower Mainland, where immunization rates are high, but the challenges we have in many focal areas, particularly in the interior in the north. We also, this is the geographic distribution of cumulative case counts over uh, the, since the pandemic started. And again, we can see there's no area of this province that has been unaffected by the pandemic. And th some areas have had way higher case rates than others, and many of those now are being attenuated by the fact that we have immunizations. And this gives a sense of our uh, distribution of vaccination by local health or community health service area across the province. And the good news is we see very high case rates, uh, very high vaccination rates across the province, but hot spots that correspond to some of the areas where we're seeing right now the flare-ups and the numbers of cases go up. 
some of the uh, data that we look at on a regular basis are these dot plots of, um, by local health area. And uh, the good news is we can see that where we've been paying attention to some of the higher case rates, particularly in the central Okanagan, those have now come down. But we also see uh, pockets of higher uh, transmission rates in areas across the interior. And we know across the interior there's been challenges over this past two months. Um, everything from the forest fires and the heat and the smoke areas and displacement of people that have also interfered with the ability to prevent transmission but also to get immunization rates up in many communities. And so this is a focus that we're paying attention to now. We also see some uh, higher case rates in areas of low immunization in the northern health region. Some of those areas, the Niska and Nichako, for example, very small numbers can lead to high rates per population because it is a small population. But it does give us an indication that we need to pay attention to some of these areas as well where we're starting to see now rising clusters and cases. This is our epidemic curve from the beginning. And what we can see is um, uh, that uh, starting in the middle of July, we started to see cases increase again, and that's that green line on the top. What is not increasing at the same rate as what we've seen previously is hospitalizations. They are coming up to an area, uh, to a rate that is um, affecting our ability to provide health care in some areas of the province, particulars we're seeing in the interior and now in the north. Um, the case rates themselves are being driven primarily by the uh, clusters and the increases that we're seeing in interior health. So to put it in perspective, in interior health, the, it represents about 15 percent of the population. But as we can see from this graph as well, uh, the rapid rise in cases in the last month in interior health, where about 50 percent of the cases that we've seen in the last month are in that health area, representing, as I said, 15 percent of the population. While we are seeing increases as well in some of the other health authorities, particularly for the more populous, Fraser and Vancouver Health Authority, the rate of rise is not the same. Um, we are starting to see as well um, uh, dramatic increases in the north again as well. If we break this down, though, by uh, what we're seeing in terms of people who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And just looking from the 1st of July and separating out what we're seeing in terms of numbers of people being infected with COVID and hospitalizations, we see a dichotomy. And what we're seeing is this has become a pandemic that is spreading rapidly amongst pockets of people who are unvaccinated. We see this very clearly in this cases per 100,000 and in the hospitalizations. And for people who are fully vaccinated, so having two doses of vaccine, that level has been low and steady and hospitalizations have been low. And we'll talk a bit more in this presentation about some of the the breakthrough cases and where we're seeing transmission happening. As I mentioned, uh, by health authority, the biggest increase in cases has been in the, in the interior health region, which have accounted for about half of the cases we've seen in the last month. Um, but we have also started to see in the last couple of weeks a gentle increase as well in uh, Fraser and Vancouver Coastal and a, a spike in cases in the north. We want to be paying attention to who is getting infected with COVID-19. And as we've seen in the last waves that we've had, it really starts and is being driven with rapid increase in those who are most connected in our community. So young people between the ages of 19 and 39 are driving uh, the rise and increase in cases. And we know in that age group, they were the last of our age groups to be able to uh, access immunization. And we know that they're very highly connected in that age group. Um, we're parents, we're working, we have connections and social connections uh, where this virus can take advantage of those who are unvaccinated and can spread rapidly. We're also seeing the increase as we did in previous waves uh, with the 40 to 59 year old age group. And in this age group, the risk of being hospitalized has gone up. What we aren't seeing is dramatic increases in young children or in those over age of 80. However, um, even though they're small numbers, we are seeing people over the age of 80 being more likely to be hospitalized if they do get infected. 
And this is important. If we look at hospitalizations, we've been watching very carefully. We know in some parts of the world, particularly in the U.S., we're seeing a, a rise in cases and severe cases in, in children, particularly children under the age of 12. So we have been watching that carefully, and we are not seeing that, both in counts of children who are hospitalized, and we can see the bottom line, uh, the 0 to 19-year-old age group, we're not seeing hospitalization rates, and we're not seeing rates of hospitalization high in that group either. As I mentioned, we do see um, if there's breakthrough or cases uh, in unvaccinated people over the age of 80, the risk of hospitalization is higher, and the rate of hospitalization is the highest in that group. But the numbers of people who are being hospitalized around the province right now are highest in the 40 to 59 year age group. And I'll show you some more information about the, the risk in terms of people who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. This is an update of the slide we've uh, presented a number of times looking at the distribution of cases and hospitalizations and the more severe illness by age. We still see that uh, young children under the age of 10 and the 10 to 19 year old age group are much less likely to have severe illness to end up in hospital or ICU. And that is holding. What we are seeing continually is that uh, uh, the risk of severe illness is going up in people who are older and that continues to be driving um, the hospitalizations and deaths. What we put together with that, however, is seeing uh, the progress that we're making in vaccination across BC by age group and by numbers of doses. So uh, people who are 70 and over, we have a very strong, very high rate of immunization, both with first and second doses. And that's important because the risk in people who are unvaccinated in that age group is the highest. Well, where we still have work to do is some of the younger age groups who are, le who are later to come um, into being able to access vaccine. But now we have the opportunities for everybody to be immunized with both doses in the next few weeks. And we're going to be focusing on young adults who are going back to university, recognizing how important it is and how negatively impacted um, particularly young adults have been in j this pandemic, whether it's from unemployment, uh, job difficulties, whether it's been trying to go to first year of university online. And so we've been putting a lot of time and effort into making sure that we can provide immunization and support people to get back to, to universities and to, to, um, uh, to school safely in the next few weeks. So this is some of the information that helps us understand risk and how well the vaccines have been working in protecting people, both from disease but also from serious illness. So over the past month, from the end of July until August 26, fully vaccinated people accounted for just 15 percent of the cases that we had. So over 70 percent of the cases were in the very small proportion of people, less than a quarter of people in the, in the province, who were not yet immunized. Hospitalizations show even a greater disparity, where 81 percent of our hospitalizations of the 394 people who have been in hospital in this month, 81 percent of them are people who were not yet vaccinated. Uh, when we look at deaths, we know that deaths continue to occur primarily amongst older people. They are most at risk, and what we are seeing reflected in the number of people who have died. We have had 33 deaths in that month. And a third of them were in people who were in long-term care. And it, it reflects the fact that we have very high immunization rates in residents of long-term care. But once this virus, particularly this highly transmissible, transmissible strain that we're seeing circulating in BC now, once it gets into long-term care homes, even older, fully vaccinated people can become ill and can die from it. And that's reflected in the proportion that we're seeing in people who've died. And if we break this down by age, and so along the bottom we have the age categories, and the top row what we're looking at is vaccinations in, a, in the entire population in BC. So that's all of the population, not just people who are eligible. Um, we see that uh, in the 0 to 11, those who are not yet eligible, um, the number of people in that age group is about 600,000. So those are the people that the rest of us need to protect by stopping transmission of this virus and by being immunized ourselves. 
When we look at the number of cases, we do have cases in that unvaccinated young group, but we also have peaks of cases in people in their 20 to 40 year old age group. And if we look across the way, we see very high vaccination rates in older people, and we see the number of cases is very low as people are vaccinated. The number of hospitalizations, again, the the reflects uh, the unvaccinated predominantly are in hospital and predominantly in the 20, 30 and 40 year old age group. We see a shift to older people with breakthrough uh, cases um, at a lower level being hospitalized um, after they've had two doses. And the number of deaths, as I said, uh, reflects the fact that many of these occur in long term care. And Sadly, we've had unvaccinated people in their 40s and 50s who have succumbed to COVID-19. So that's looking at numbers and the proportions uh, in different um, vaccinated and unvaccinated age groups. Really important is to look at rates. So what is the rate of transmission in people who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated? And from July 1st to August 27th, what we see across the board is that uh, case rates by uh, amongst those who are unvaccinated, and this is crude, so we're not adjusting for things like age, are 10 times higher than those who are fully vaccinated. And that purple line along the bottom is the one to look at. What it shows us is that immunization keeps rates low and continually keeps rates low, even when transmission is exploding in, in communities. And we particularly see that in the India health region where the rate of transmission and the rate of infection in people who are unimmunized is at least 10 times greater. And that's uh, reflected across the board. If we look at the same information, so case rates by vaccination status and break it down by age, again we see a slight increase in the 0 to 11 year olds, but primarily what we're seeing is people who are fully vaccinated are, have a very low and stable case rate across the age groups. This tells us that vaccines work regardless of the variant that's been spreading and we know it's been Delta for the last month during this period of time that these vaccines, particularly after two doses, are very protective. Protective after a single dose across the age group. Um, and it is primarily those who are unvaccinated where we're seeing cases rise. And so the other part that we want to look at is severe illness. So hospitalization rate by uh, vaccination status. And what we see again is that uh, two doses of vaccine are highly protective. So for crude hospitalization rates among the unvaccinated, it's 17 times higher than somebody who has received both doses of vaccine. And even in areas of high transmission in the interior and now in the north, we're still seeing that these vaccines are very protective against severe illness that leads people to need hospitalization. Looking at that same information by uh, vaccination status and hospitalization by age, it is even more stark where a vaccination, um, people who are vaccinated uh, are protected from hospitalization across the board. A slight increase in people over the age of 80, but for the most part what we're seeing is very strong protection across the board, across the age groups in people who are vaccinated. So how to sum all this up? looking at where we're seeing case rates, where we're seeing breakthrough, the numbers and the proportions, and then adjusting for age. So this means if I'm a 50-year-old person who is unvaccinated, I have 12 times the risk of getting infected with COVID-19 and 34 times the chance of ending up in hospital from somebody who's been vaccinated who's the same age as me. And this is important because adjusting for age, we know that um, our ability to develop response to the vaccine is dependent on age and our chances of having serious outcomes if we do get infected with COVID-19 is also uh, related to age. And what we are seeing is these vaccines are very protective across all age groups, one from transmission, but particularly from severe illness. And the risk is 34 times greater that you're going to end up in hospital if you're unvaccinated at that same age. So all along, we've been looking at 
um, modeling as ways to help us understand what's happened, where we uh, can make adjustments, and what are the potential for things to happen in the future. And one of the models that we look at regularly is the dynamic modeling that looks at our reproductive number, so what we call RT. And the estimates are shown for the last week. And what they are showing now, uh, we've been updating these and running the models to understand where we are now and with a projection for the near future. And we give a range of values because, as we know, um, there's a degree of uncertainty to every model that we run. What we are seeing now is that we had a, a, um, we were at a place where we had a lot of transmission, where we were up about 1.5, which means for every person who was infected, they passed it on to, to almost two other people. We're now back down across the board to somewhere very close to one. But it's around that. So we're, we've seen a leveling off of our case numbers that reflects this as well. But it still means that for every person's infected, they're passing it on to one other person. And that means that our, our trajectory is going to be um, continuing. What we want to do is to be able to reduce those infectious contacts, so the chances that we're going to transmit to somebody else and bring it down below one, and that way we can, uh, the, the outbreak will be fading away. So that's one of the measures that we look at. We've also been looking over uh, the last uh, 20 months at different types of dynamic models that help us understand what are the, the factors that are the important drivers. Is it vaccination? Is it mask wearing? Is it measures that we're taking in the community? Which are the factors that make a difference in our epidemic? And what I'm going to show is a few of the, the models that we presented in the past and what actually happened to help put in context how we can use models to understand what could happen, to understand the parameters, but not as a prediction. And I've said this at the very beginning, that models help us understand what are the important things that we need to pay attention to, and they can tell you what may happen, but none of them can tell you what will happen. And much of it depends on the measures we put in place, how effective those measures are, and our own behavior. So in November 2020, the model on the top, I presented a, a model that had this line in blue that showed a potential trajectory of, of where we might be um, given the rates that we were seeing in the community. And of course, this was in the absence of vaccination. So we started putting restrictions in, in the Lower Mainland when we started seeing cases increase there. And then on November 19th, we put in more province-wide um, restrictions. And as you can see, our reported cases came down. And that's because we know that people changed their behavior and the measures we took made a difference in how we were interacting with each other and how the trajectory of the pandemic curve went. But really important is that when we present models, we need to present them with some degree of uncertainty because none of them are, are right. None of them are predictions. But they can give you a range of possibilities of what could happen if nothing changed. In uh, April, we also presented modeling prior to around the time that we put in our circuit breaker measures uh, er, later in March. And at that point, we were able to factor in uh, vaccination by age group into the models. And so that's, so that's why they looked a little different. But what we saw was the rate of infectious contacts included with vaccination included in the model and recognizing this was one of the things that helped us make the decision to put in the, the measures that we did at that time because we recognized we are not yet at a place where immunization was high enough that it could prevent some of the transmission chains in our community. So these two examples of past modeling projections um, both illustrate how changes in actions actually changed our pandemic trajectory. It helped us bend the curve, as it were. In June, we also presented some modeling. 
And that modeling took into account, again, a number of, of interacting factors, which were higher vaccine uptake that we were in a place of at that time, as well as what the, the impact would be of increasing our infectious contacts. Because we were at the point where we needed to, uh, as cases were coming down, we needed to get back to the social interactions, to those connections, um, to workplaces, to businesses, to some of those functions that we had been missing for so long. So as part of our restart plan, we were looking at what are the, the potential impacts given our, the immunization we were at, given all of the other factors, and um, the increase in infectious contacts that we were expecting to happen when we started to open up again through the summer. It was also as part of our thinking around why uh, the measures that we were taking, where we said, you know, an incentive to be vaccinated was um, that masks would no longer be that absolute necessary for people who had been immunized in certain situations. That we were able to gather together outdoors with less restrictions as immunization rates went up. As you can see. Um, models revealed that there is uncertainty in everything that we do. And we were um, following along a very low trajectory until the middle of July when we started to see this increase. And this increase, as I've mentioned, is driven primarily by the lower rates of immunization and the really dramatically higher rates of infectious contacts driven in the, uh, primarily in the interior health. And so these are things that we could not at the time have predicted, but are the reasons why we, we knew that we might have to take regional measures to address some of this increasing. So the other thing that we have learned from the models, and it's been helpful that there have been many different modeling groups, both in BC and across Canada, that give us a sense of, of uh, people using different models, different parameters, and what may happen depending on uh, what um, they put into the models. So all models are, uh, are wrong, as we've said before, but many of them are useful. And it's interesting for me as a de decision maker in our team to be able to look at what other modelers are doing as well as our own teams. And really, the small changes in parameters can lead to large changes in outcomes, and that's what we're seeing here with that higher inspect than expected rate in interior health in July and August. In the context, of lower immunization rates in those communities. So factoring all this in, we've uh, now um, gone on to develop the next models to help us understand where we are now and to inform the decision making as we go into this next month. So these models are, are focusing on the situation that we're dealing with now and where we um, could be in the next, uh, at, by the end of September recognizing that we have increasing immunization rates, we have a more infectious virus that is circulating. There's some indications that it may be uh, lead to more hospitalizations in some people. But also recognizing that across the age strata, we have more people protected at different age groups and our risk of hospitalization is different um, depending on vaccination status and age. So we've uh, factored in a number of those things as well as how a modest increase in immunization at different age groups can make a big difference. Uh, so the models that we are coming up with now uh, show a lower transmission scenario. So we're talking about a lower and a medium transmission scenario based on what we're seeing with our reproductive number. And this shows that we are likely to see a gradually steady uh, increasing number of cases over the next month and slightly increasing hospitalizations over the next month, but not at the rate that we were seeing our, our daily maximum during the second and third waves of the pandemic. And that's because of the protection that we're seeing from immunization. But the interesting thing and the important thing that we all need to think about is that by getting more people immunized, particularly a small percentage increase in those uh, people 12 to 17 in the 20-year-old age group, in the 30-year-old age group, in all of those groups who are not yet at that 85, 90 percent range can make a tremendous difference in the trajectory of our pandemic in the next month. And that would lead to decreased numbers of cases and decreased hospitalizations. And even with 
a moderate transmission scenario, so a, a reproductive number that is higher than what we're seeing right now, with the same parameters about this highly, more highly transmissible variant that we're seeing in the province, with the actual protection that we're seeing from vaccination right now, we would likely see an, an increasing rate of cases over the next month, as well as increasing hospitalizations. But that small incremental increase in immunization means that that will level off and hospitalizations will level off. So these are the things that we are learning now. We learned that this virus is, uh, this vaccine is protection and the protection is lasting even in people who are older um, after two doses. That's important and that it can make a difference in our being able to get back to those things that we need to do in our lives. Particularly we know that having vaccines means that we can get back to school safely, we can get back to university safely, we can get back to work, we can get back to doing things um, like going to hockey games, like going to football games. As long as we have vaccinated people together, the risk goes down dramatically. So finally, we uh, put in a model um, that shows um, not only the, the vaccination, uh, the transmission scenarios that I've just said, but one with no vaccination. So the position that we were in in previous waves, where we would see a dramatic increase with the, the rate of transmission and the numbers of cases we're seeing right now. So what does this tell us? This tells us that vaccines are working, that they're preventing thousands of cases and hospitalizations from occurring, because they are protecting people across the age spectrum. They're making a difference, but we're not where we need to be yet. And we need to continue to walk this fine line of trying to reduce the, the impacts of the virus, both on us as uh, individuals, but on our families, our communities, but also reduce the societal impacts that the measures we've had to take to prevent transmission. So the most important actions we can take now to stop this transmission and to bend our curve back down are to decrease our infectious contacts. That means going back to our basics, wearing masks when we're in indoor crowded places, those higher risk settings, making sure we're staying home and away from others if we're feeling unwell ourselves, cleaning our hands regularly, avoiding large crowds, particularly with unvaccinated people, because we know it can spread so easily now in those populations, while doing everything we can to support our family members, our friends to be vaccinated. That is the way that we will get through this, that we'll get through this respiratory season and we'll get back to spending time with the people that we love, doing the things that we need to do and having those activities that we love as well. We will continue to monitor these data and to look at regional measures as ways to try and, and reduce the, the effects both of the pandemic and of these measures across the province. We know that regional measures can make a difference and that we don't need to do the broad measures that we've had to do in the past. This has been a long 20 months. And we are walking, as I said, a fine line, balancing the risk of COVID and this disruption to society that this pandemic has caused. And we see that in so many parts of our society, whether it's young people who have had challenges in getting jobs, not being able to get back to educational opportunities, with the dramatic increase in the toxic drug supply that we're seeing and the effects that it's having on our families and communities. We need to get back to school. We need to get back to university and college. We know those are things that are important for us as a society and for our future. And we can do this safely. And we also need to continue to care for each other, to support each other, to reduce those transmission risks, to support everyone in our family, in our community to be vaccinated and to get us through with kindness and compassion and patience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henry, and uh, it was a significant presentation. We want to take questions. I won't take very long. I want to make a couple of points. First of all, um, as of today, 
3,908,860 British Columbians received their first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. That's 84.3 percent. 76.5 percent have received their second dose. The number of people who have a single dose is down to 7.8 percent of people. And uh, we've seen since uh, the Premier and Dr. Henry introduced the BC vaccine card, which will be coming into effect September 13th, a significant uptake over the last week in immunization. I want to acknowledge uh, groups who have really stepped up in the last week. Those, first of all, in the categories from 12 to 30 have seen an increase in their rate of vaccination twice the level of the provincial average, which means that uh, what we know, that those, particularly those 18 to 24, who have really stepped up and who are currently vaccinated at an 83.8% level and will soon pass the provincial average are really stepping up and understanding, I think, the value of vaccination now. And that's, uh, that's an important and positive thing. Secondly, we have seen, uh, well, Interior Health and Northern Health areas of BC have trailed in terms of overall vaccination by health authority. We've seen the largest increase of first dose immunization in those two health authorities, which is a positive sign, and we need that to continue because I believe that we can do this together. I want to remind people, and uh, you'll get a chance to review uh, the slides presented by Dr. Henry today, and I remind people what the slide on page 20 says. It says that after adjusting for age differences, unvaccinated people are at greater risk of infection, hospitalization, or death from COVID-19 than fully vaccinated people. In terms of cases, 12 times more likely. In terms of hospitalizations, 34 times more likely. And that's why, as you understand, the measures that are being taken from the BC vaccine card to regional measures focus on where we see transmission now. We've got to continue to support each other and work together in these times. One of the things that's striking if you look at the, the charts and the provincial maps on page two and three is that the places that are seeing, many of the places that are seeing highest transmission now have not seen that much transition through the, through the whole period of the pandemic. And what that says to us is whether, wherever you live, whether you live in Nelson or Fort St. John or Surrey or Victoria or Port Alberni, wherever you live in BC, we have to be there and support one another in these times. And that's why we have to continue to take the measures we need to all take to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. But what is centrally important is that the increases in vaccination that we've seen in the last week continue, that we go from 84.3 percent and we're significantly higher than that, that we aspire to do what I think British Columbia can do, which is to lead the world in our level of vaccination. Because you, have, you see in this modeling, you see it everywhere, that when we get vaccinated, we make ourselves safer, we make the ones we love safer, we make our communities safer, we're able to do things that we can't do if we're not vaccinated. It is the right choice for this time, and I encourage everyone to take advantage of it as soon as they can, to get registered right away, today, and to get vaccinated with their first dose, and if they've had their first dose, and get vaccinated with their second dose. And while we do a lot of discussion about the age question, remind people there are about 148,000 British Columbians over the age of 60 who are unvaccinated as well. And those numbers mean and apply to that group of people too. So I want to encourage everyone to consider that choice. Consider the ones they love, consider their community, consider that we are living with all the challenges of this COVID-19 pandemic and other challenges like the public health emergency that is the overdose crisis and others, and to take the step that we can all take today as people and get vaccinated. Thank you very much, and we're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to reporters on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up today. First question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. <coughs> Hi there, uh, Dr. Henry. I'm just uh, wondering, this model that you have with uh, the moderate uh, transmission shows that we could be headed for record levels of transmission in about a month, more than a thousand cases a day. Um, and if we look at the previous modeling, uh, when we were approaching that level, um, we saw other measures come in to try and stop that transmission. Are you considering any other measures at this time 
and just wondering how you're feeling about the contact tracing that's happening at this time. Is it manageable or are things being done differently to kind of cope with the numbers we're seeing now? Yeah, really good questions. Um, so we have put in some measures, uh, you know, looking at the models over the last few weeks, um, the, the, the importance of wearing masks again in those indoor settings, um, the measures that we're putting in place for the post-secondary and for, for schools, making sure that we can do that safely, recognizing how important they are, but also the regional measures that we've put in place in, in areas where we are seeing those clusters and, and outbreaks that are spreading and affecting different parts of the community, whether it's businesses being able to operate or the health care system. And, and uh, you know, sadly, uh, us, like, like across Canada, we have a very thin um, line of, of defense in our, our health care system, and it can be a small number of people that can whelm the system, as we saw in the interiors we're seeing in, uh, starting in the north. So uh, as we're seeing with my public health colleagues, so yes, it is uh, straining our, uh, some of our case and contact management, um, but we are focused again on the, the uh, making sure that every case gets contact um, and that we understand the, the risk settings. So we are prioritizing risk settings, but it's not so much because we're um, whelmed with cases, which is part of it, but it's also because we know that the, some people are at lower risk now. So you're at lower risk of being infected and lower risk of transmitting to others if you are fully vaccinated. And what we're finding is the transmission chains uh, from social interactions from a party, for example, where we might have seen um, 30 or 40 people be out of 100 being infected uh, a few months ago, now that the majority of the people in that environment are immunized, we're seeing just the uh, the unvaccinated and a small proportion of vaccinated people. So it may transmit to to five or six people. So yes, we have modified some of our uh, contact management for some of those very low risk settings, uh, priority places. If if people haven't been in. Uh, in group communal settings, for example, um, but we are committed and will continue to do uh, case management of every single case and contact follow up, particularly in those higher uh, priority settings. Bender, do you have a follow up? I do. I have a question for a colleague. Um, uh, the Ministry of Education, as you know, is working on improving ventilation in classrooms. So I'm just, uh, are you advising them uh, based on the airborne transmissibility of the original? Uh, type COVID or the Delta variant, and uh, why aren't you doing more to promote promote better ventilation in other workplaces and social settings? Given how many cases we're seeing, yeah, well, absolutely. Ventilation has been something we've been uh, uh, working on from the very beginning. Um, absolutely, every school in the province has done an assessment, and I know the Minister of of education was talking about that. And absolutely, the, the way this virus is transmitted has not changed. So whether it's the virus we had, the strain we had last week, uh, the strain we had last year, um, the way it is transmitted has not changed. The dose that you uh, need to be infected has gone down. So a more transmissible virus means that you just need a smaller amount uh, to generally, we think that's what it is, is that a smaller amount um, can cause infection. So all of those things around ventilation are important. We did a lot of work with WorkSafe VC around different workplaces, the higher risk workplaces, for example, the, the food processing uh, plants where we saw a lot of transmission. We've done a number of different measures and we see that they are working. Some of them are ventilation, it's about barriers, it's about immunization of people in those settings and that right now is holding but we are continuing to work with work safe around workplaces around the province around some of these really important issues next question is from lisa yusta news 11:30. hi there dr henry i'm um, talking about kids and we know everybody's going back to school next week and anxious you said that there aren't many increase you know there isn't a great increase with children but looking at the situation report you know, it's gone from 45 in the 0 to 10 group on July 24th to 322 in the most recent one. And then again, it's like a five times increase over that same four week for the older students. So are we just going to see an explosion in schools when they come back? And how are you going to keep up with contact tracing there if it's already strained? 
Yeah, no, you know, these are things that we, we try and, and, and focus on, understanding the context where transmission is happening to children. So we know from, from last year that the measures we had in place in schools meant that there was very little transmission in, in school settings. And we're seeing that, uh, you know, that's why we put in place the, the same measures that we had pretty much in place last year. The focus on ventilation over the summer, the importance of masking, the importance of not having crowding and and uh, people gathering together, particularly indoors, and uh, wearing masks in those settings. So we don't expect to see an explosion of cases. It is absolutely not surprising that we will see an increase of cases, and they're related to communities where we're seeing increased transmission in the community. So again, the most important thing we can do is to have all of those who are eligible for vaccination in the school setting to be immunized, whether that's school staff, educators, parents of children who are uh, not yet able to be vaccinated, it's really important because your child's risk is directly related to the risk in their family of the adults in their family and the older siblings. So we will be are, are already working with the, the school boards to, to make sure that we have vaccines available in the first few weeks of school. Those are going to be important things. And you know, I'm really heartened when I talk to young people in school, I talk to educators, you know, we, we know how to do this. We safely kept schools open last year. We saw the impact when we started to immunize teachers as a, and edu people who work in the school um, as a priority and transmission rates went down. So these are the things that will make schools safer again this year. We all just need to, uh, um, you, you know, it's not, it's going to be a really um, important and good thing for kids to get back into the classroom next week. It's going to be a little bit anxiety provoking, of course. Um, but encouraging children to wear masks, even young children, to wear masks in the school setting, and to keep all of those measures in place that we know work. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, just one thing that, uh, that didn't get answered there is about the contact tracing and how the tracers will keep up with it if they're already a little bit swamped and strained with what's going on in the province right now. And are, is there any way for parents to know if their teachers have been vaccinated? And how will they know if there have been cases in the school? Is it going to be the same sort of notice as last year? So we're not concerned. The priority, of course, will be those settings uh, like schools. Um, so all of the health authorities have prioritized that is one of the settings where we will be following up on every case. Well, we're following up on all of the cases, but the schools are, are absolutely a priority. We've been rehiring over the past few months uh, that some of the case and contact or re bringing back in some of the case and contact management staff who had been redeployed to things like immunization programs. So all of that has been happening. I am confident we will be with every single school as we have been over the past uh, two years um, to make sure that we can manage every communicable disease, including COVID. It will, be, um, it, it will be slightly different this year because the risk is different with the high rates of immunization that we're seeing. Um, and we've seen now that uh, transmission to people when you have that wall of vaccination is much, much less. We will not be doing the, the uh, notifications to school if there's been a single exposure. They'll be doing an assessment as we do for every communicable disease and every individual who's at risk will be notified. So it will be, uh, we've heard very clearly from uh, people that, uh, that the majority of people felt that uh, the school-based letters were more anxiety-provoking than helpful, but we will absolutely be keeping the schools informed and working with the schools schools with our school response teams to make sure that every single case in the school setting is identified, the contacts are managed, and that the people um, are informed about what's happening in the school setting. And yes, every cluster or outbreak will be reported. Keith Baldry, Global News. relatively lower vaccination rates in the interior in the north, which means thousands of people in many small towns are completely unvaccinated. Given that pretty well all these towns have very small hospitals or certainly a, a small number of ICU beds, is there a concern that it wouldn't take much to overwhelm some of the ICU uh, bed system? We already had a physician in trail worry last week. There was four out of six 
beds were COVID people, and he was worried that it wouldn't take much to literally overwhelm the critical care system in some of these towns with low vaccination rates. Is that, is that a, a genuine concern? It, it is. I think there's a couple of things that we have going for us, if you will, is that uh, it, it, we're, we're seeing very high immunization rates in older people. Older people are more likely to end up in hospital. But as I, you know, the data shows, that doesn't mean um, people aren't going to end up in hospital. And as you say, we're stretched very thin. We have a very thin um, health care system right now, particularly in critical care. And people have been doing this for a long time. And we've seen through the summer that uh, ICUs have not been empty. They've been filling up with non-COVID cases of people who have serious illness that needs to be managed. Um, so yes, um, physicians are tired. Nurses are tired. Our health system has been working on this for a long time, and it is stretched. So yes, that's why we took the measures we did in, in Kelowna and in Kamloops and, um, to try and address some of the issues that we're seeing in some of these communities where uh, illness in healthcare workers can can affect the ability of the hospital to function as well as illness in the community. But I think you can talk to some of the other challenges. I, I, think, uh, I think the point that Dr. Henry made is very important, Keith, in that regard, is that if you look at uh, older age categories, they're pretty consistent throughout the country, uh, throughout the province. There is a difference between, for example, Fraser Health and Northern Health and Interior Health overall, but that difference is focused in on those uh, uh, under 50. Uh, we do see the significant risk of hospitalization. And I think that the point we make about our healthcare system is that one of the reasons why we're building so many new hospitals and, uh, uh, and investing so much money in increasing staff is that our healthcare system uh, prior to COVID-19 was running in March of uh, 2020, uh, prior to any uh, hospitalizations due to COVID-19, at 103.5% of capacity. And some of those other issues are moving back to where they were. It's why we're building hospitals. It's why we're uh, increasing our training. It's why we're investing in surgeries. It's why we're doing all these other things in our healthcare system. So uh, while we see fewer people in hospital right now than we did at the height of the third wave, where I think it reached about 503, we're seeing we're at about a third of that level. It still puts significant pressure on the system and does regionally. So uh, that's the reason why it's so important and why we're taking the strategies we're using now. It's so important that people get vaccinated. And it's why we're focused in on where the transmission is, which leads to hospitalization, which is uh, on those who are unvaccinated. And it's really important to do that. And I'm, I'm heartened by the efforts being made uh, everywhere in BC uh, for people to get vaccinated. We've seen this uptick in the numbers in the last week that we need to continue to see in the interior and the north because that's going to help us as well. Regional measures that were put in place, for example, in the central Okanagan help us. And they help all of those working in our healthcare system deliver all of the services that are needed for all of the health conditions, including um, uh, mental health and addictions uh, services, but uh, as well all of our ho hospital and other services. So this is the work we need to do. So the message everywhere is that the more we raise vaccination levels, the better it is. I live uh, in a, a community health service area of 50,000 people, Renfrew, Collingwood. About 46,000 of them are currently vaccinated, about 93 percent. It's a little over 46,000, but 3,300 aren't vaccinated. But still, our situation would be even better if we reduce that number even more. So we have to do this work everywhere in BC. And the part of the effort to reduce uh, transmission and to increase vaccination, that will, the reduced transmission will flow from that, is to ensure that we have um, the resources in place to deal with all the other health problems we're facing. Follow up, Keith? Follow up, Keith? Yes. Um, further to Lisa's questions about schools, Dr. Henry, earlier today you said you were on, just on a conference call with some counterparts at the U.S. Uh, Center for Disease Control about school kids uh, and schools starting again. I'm just wondering if you picked up anything new from their experience, or did they also perhaps, given our successful year of opening schools, did they ask you for tips on what to do? Uh, uh, some really interesting things, actually. We were, uh, it was a good exchange of, uh, of information. Um, obviously, we wanted to understand 
uh, what the plans were, how things were working in, and you know, we, we think it's challenging with 10 provinces and three territories and they have over 50, as you know, 51. Um, so uh, basically what we were trying to understand is the reports that we were seeing about increasing rates of severe illness and hospitalization in children that has been reported in the U.S. and um, those data are being looked at right now, but it really uh, looks like um, it's a function of of immunization in the community and where you have rates of transmission that are very high, it affects young people as well as, as older people. Um, it doesn't seem to be virulence, so the Delta variant, which is the predominant variant that's being transmitted across the U.S. Um, excuse me. <coughs> It's hard to tease out a number of factors, but it really is related more to areas where there's where there's lower immunization. They're seeing higher rates of cases in the community, including higher rates of cases in children. So that's something that uh, we're seeing reflected in our data as well, and reassures us that it's not uh, something that's inherent in the virus right now. It's more about how important it is that we all protect those who cannot yet be immunized. Next question is from April Lawrence, Czech News. Oh, hi, thanks so much. Um, I just had a question um, in regard to the reproductive rates on slide 21. Um, here in Island Health, it's showing um, a higher number um, than most of the rest of the province when we have some of the lower case rates and higher vaccination rates. So I'm just wondering if you can explain some of the factors that drive this reproductive rate. Yeah, so the reproductive rate is, is how many people I transmit to on average uh, for every infected case. How many, how many people on average does every infected case transmit to? And so that's a combination of things. And yes, we see in the, on the island, um, as you say, lower case numbers, which means there's a wider confidence interval. So it's somewhere in between that range. But what it reflects is a higher rate of infectious contacts, which means somebody who's infected with the virus is having contact with more people and able to transmit it to more people. So things that we do that stop that are staying away from others if we're feeling unwell ourselves. Um, if we've been exposed to somebody who has uh, COVID-19, not going and uh, into uh, closed environments and, and talking with other people, keeping our groups low, but also uh, things like wearing masks in those indoor settings, cleaning our hands, all of those basic things. But also right now we're seeing that if you are vaccinated and you've been exposed, your risk is much, much less. So immunization, and yes, as you say, we have very high rates of immunization on the island, but it's not equal across all age groups. So what we're seeing is transmission in clusters to groups of people who are unvaccinated and that's m mainly um, people younger in their 20 to 40 year old age range. So driving up immunization and staying away from others if you're sick and getting tested, those are the important things uh, to try and uh, bring that back down again. April, do you have a follow up? Yeah, I do. A question for a colleague. Um, private care operators are saying that hundreds of long-term care workers are preparing to quit and move to acute and community health care settings where vaccines are not currently mandatory. So uh, we're wondering if you have any plans to implement mandatory vaccines in these other health care settings. Um, the short answer is yes. I, I think I've indicated this before. We know that there are some settings where it is incredibly important to prevent transmission of this virus. One, to keep ourselves healthy as healthcare workers, and we talked about um, how stretched the healthcare workforce has been over this past year. So it is incredibly important that we pr keep ourselves well so that we can care for people in the healthcare setting, but also so we're not passing it on to our colleagues. And we know there are high risk settings in acute care and home care and community care. So uh, we are have been working through Obviously, there's uh, um, labor relations issues that we need to work through, and we have been working those through with uh, um, uh, with the unions and with others. And so you will hear something about that very soon. I don't know if you want to talk to it as well. Um, but the short answer is yes. This is an important, important um, measure for all of us in healthcare across the board 
from acute care to long-term care. We know it's most dangerous and most, most lethal in long-term care, and that's why we started with that group of people, and we need to ensure that everybody in that setting is immunized, and uh, we're working through the details for the other health care settings. That's right, and I think the message across the board in healthcare and everywhere else is to get vaccinated. We've made this point. It's a, it's a, it's important as well on Vancouver Island as in, in as a, everywhere else in BC. I know that Vancouver Island has a somewhat older population than other regions of the province, which leads because in uh, populations over 60, we have a very high vaccination rate to a higher overall vaccination rate, but it, but it simply can be higher under 50 and, and higher in some regions of the island. So we want to make uh, those efforts to make sure that that happens. With respect to um, health care workers in general, the other point to, that we're obviously concerned about in acute care is every hospital in BC, but uh, particularly uh, regional hospitals, have a number of uh, what we call alternate level of care beds. Uh, people who are effectively either waiting for long-term care or in a form of long-term care within the hospital. So some of the same conditions apply and the risks apply. And so obviously that's something we're looking at and you're going to hear uh, more about with respect to both acute care and the community in the coming uh, um, short while. We have time for one more question this afternoon. As a reminder to everybody on the phone line, Minister Dix and Dr. Henry will release a statement later this afternoon with all the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks. Last question today is from Isabel Ragham, CBC. Hi there. I'll just start off by saying um, the questions for Dr. Henry, but Minister Dix, if we could please have a, an answer in French. Um, Dr. Henry, given what you said about the importance of those around kids being vaccinated to protect them, we know that they are far less likely to be hospitalized and, and get really sick from it. But why isn't the province mandating vaccinations in school settings for teachers and staff and students 12 and over? Yeah, so, uh, you know, these are, these are challenging discussions and um, mandating any medical procedure is something that we don't do lightly. And so it, it, we look at the risk and we do it proportional to risk. As we talked about, um, you know, long-term care is a setting where if the virus gets into that setting from somebody who's non-vaccinated or even vaccinated, but uh, when it gets into that setting, it can have a tremendous effect on the health of people who are living in that, uh, on residents particularly, and we know that how, how serious that can be. And that's why we focused on healthcare workers who are working in long-term care. There's a, a broad range of settings in community care and, uh, and acute care, but also we know that uh, the, the strain on the system is very high right now and, and has been for a long time. So immunization becomes incredibly important. In settings where the downside impacts of somebody being infected are, are slightly less and absolutely, you know, we have been watching and we know how important it is to prevent infection in everybody. But this virus is with us, and we we know that vaccination is also not 100%. So we have to take a measured approach. And yes, we may prioritize school staff early on to make sure that they had access to vaccines. Where uh, schools uh, 12 to 17 only recently had access to vaccines as they were approved, and we expect that uh, vaccination for uh, the 6 to 11 year olds will be coming hopefully soon in the fall. So the, we need to look at what other measures are there to protect people, what the level of immunization is in the, in the population, and take an action that's proportionate to the risk. So I am comforted that we have very high levels of immunization in, in school staff. We want it to be 100 percent, and we're going to be going out and making sure that we can get it up there as high as we can. because. Teachers know, educators know, school staff know that they want to keep themselves well and protect their families and protect the, all of the students in the school setting. But I also think it's incumbent on us all, um, parents of young children as well. It's important for you to be immunized so that we keep our schools as safe as possible. But we also know that there are other measures that help augment us as we go through this uh, respiratory season, and we'll be working with schools to do that too. So it is a, it's a really complicated um, risk-based assessment that we do. 
know, complicated is the right word, but making sure that we uh, take the risk and benefits uh, into account um, and do it in a way that's proportional. Merci beaucoup. La raison pour laquelle on a pris l'action pour la vaccination obligatoire dans les centres de, de soins au long terme les centres et les autres centres pour des personnes de troisième âge, euh, c'est euh, en proportion de, du risque de la situation. Euh, nous avons eu, euh, tout le monde euh, euh, peut se rendre compte du fait qu'on a on a eu des centaines de gens qui sont morts dans nos, nos, nos centres de soins euh, pour des personnes de troisième âge, pour d'autres personnes qui ont besoin de soins, soins au long terme. Donc, on, a, on prend l'action vis-à-vis euh, -vis de manière euh, proportionnelle au risque euh, pour des gens euh, qui travaillent et, et, et qui habitent dans ces circonstances. C'est un peu différent. C'est aussi important dans des écoles. Je suis confiant que la grande majorité de nos euh, enseignants, nos professeurs, sont, euh, en, sont vaccinés actuellement. Et on va faire des grands efforts pendant les deux semaines à venir, surtout pour, euh, pour offrir euh, la vaccination à tout le monde, que ce soit des, des jeunes de 12 à 17 ans ou des professeurs, pour assurer que la, le niveau de vaccination est aussi élevé que possible dans ces circonstances. Aussi, on prend d'autres mesures pour protéger les gens qui travaillent dans nos écoles et deuxièmement, qui, bien sûr, qui va à l'école comme étudiant. Et donc, ces mesures sont importantes aussi. Donc, il faut être mesuré. On a commencé comme employeur, si vous voulez, euh, avec euh, le, le domaine de la santé parce que le risque est plus grand dans ce domaine. Mais on considère euh, l'importance de la vaccination pour tout le monde et on va continue, euh, continuer à poursuivre ces efforts, ces politiques dans les, euh, les jours, les semaines et les mois à suivre. Isabelle, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. And French again, please, Mr. Uh, Minister Dix, uh, for this next question. Um, are booster shots going to be made available here in BC? Uh, we know that Alberta just announced that they're starting to, to roll out or are moving towards booster shots, third shots for seniors. When could we see that happen um, in BC and for whom? Yeah, so that's something that uh, we've been following the data on for some time. So there's two groups of people that we're uh, focusing on right now. One is that there's been some data that shows that people who have certain immune compromising conditions, so people who have uh, hematologic malignancies, so blood cancers, uh, people who've had a solid organ transplant and are on immune suppressive drugs or stem cell transplant, and a certain class of, of immune suppressive drugs, um, there's data that increases shows that they don't necessarily develop a response after two doses of vaccine and that a third dose may actually um, increase the, the a probability that they'll have a good immune response. So it increases in about 55 percent of people, which means it's not a panacea. People still have to pay attention and, and it's still important for the rest of us to protect those people whose immune systems aren't able to manage as, as strong an immune response. But uh, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is looking at those data, as is our BC Immunization Committee, and operationally we're putting together the plans to be able to provide that third dose uh, to those group of people, and I expect that that will happen in the in the next week or so. The the question about when and if a booster is required for residents of long term care, it's a little bit different across the country, and those are also data that we've been watching very carefully. The National Advisory Committee is looking at it. Our immunization committee is looking at it. So far, we are not seeing a diminution of protection of across the board in long term care, but we're watching that carefully, and we need to determine what is the the appropriate interval. And it's looking like it 
maybe because we we did most uh, uh, people in long residents in long term care received uh, their vaccine at an extended interval, and we know now that that gives a stronger, longer lasting protection. So we need to determine what is the the optimal interval, and it's probably. Um, somewhere I'm speculating a little bit because I have not seen the latest on the, the data that they're an analyzing. It's probably somewhere around six to eight months. And so that would put us, for most people in long term care, somewhere around October ish, which means that we can, uh, so we're gearing up to be able to provide uh, a third dose around that period of time and um, it would be, uh, we'd be looking at uh, providing. Uh, influenza immunization around the same time. So yes, absolutely, these are, as you can tell, <laughs> questions that we're being uh, looking at the details on. Uh, the National Advisory Committee and our BC Immunization Committee are looking at it, and we'll be coming up with our recommendations around the best options and the best timing in the coming weeks. In terms of the rest of us, whether everybody needs a, a, a third dose, and I know we've seen uh, countries like um, uh, in Israel, uh, the U.S. has been speculating about you know six months or eight months, but we're in a different situation. So again, these are areas where we need to look at the vaccine effectiveness and the protection that it's continuing to provide across the board. Um, we've also started very early on here in BC and across Canada with an extended interval, as they did in the UK. And that, as I've said, gives us a, a, a stronger and longer lasting protection. So we want to make sure that, if, that we know the appropriate timing and whether it's needed. Countries like the US and Israel, they, they stuck to the very narrow window of time for the most part and so have been focusing on, uh, on booster doses in people that got uh, the first two doses quite close together. So the data that we're seeing right now uh, uh, doesn't show that we need a booster dose yet. It may be sometime in the new year for the average uh, person, starting with age probably. Um, and we're also watching uh, the, the, man, the vaccine manufacturers around uh, modifying the spike protein, for example, in the mRNA vaccines to uh, more closely match what we're seeing in terms of circulating strains. So this would be similar to what we do for influenza strains that change. So we need to balance all of those factors with the protection that we're seeing. And from the data today, you can see that we're still getting very strong protection across the board. And what is the optimal timing with which booster dose? So lots more to come on that uh, over the next few weeks and months. Okay. <laughs> three, three different things. <laughs> three things different. First, for those who Uh, qui ont des certaines conditions où le, leur système d'immunité est compromis, il y aura la grande possibilité d'une uh, troisième dose uh, dans les, uh, le, la, la période uh, bientôt, disons la période dans des semaines à suivre. Et on suit de près uh, les études sur ces questions, mais on va agir bien entendu. Pour ceux qui habitent uh, dans nos centres de soins, Uh, tout le monde sait que ici en Colombie-Britannique, l'intervalle entre les doses était uh, uh, plus long, et cela nous aide actuellement. Mais cela étant, on, uh, on est prêt à agir. Uh, le Dr. Henry a mentionné la possibilité du mois d'octobre, alors, alors qu'on fait uh, de la vaccination, uh, d'autres vaccinations dans nos, nos centres de soins. Euh, euh, serait possible. Euh, pour les gens en général, on va suivre l'évidence, bien entendu. Mais ce qui est important, je pense, que c'est qu'ici en Colombie-Britannique, on est prêt à agir. C'est-à-dire que le, le Dr. Henry, le Dr. Ballum, qui dirige euh, à la fois la santé euh, publique et, euh, et notre euh, euh, campagne d'immunisation, sont prêts depuis des mois, on travaille depuis des mois pour préparer la possibilité euh, d'une un, troisième dose euh, pour tout le monde dans la province. Donc, on va être prêt, on va suivre la science, on va suivre la santé publique, mais on a fait le travail déjà parce qu'il y aura des conditions assez différentes, peut-être, au mois d'octobre, etc., il faut euh, qu'ils vont être différents. Euh, 
que notre première dose et deuxième dose, la, la disponibilité des, des, des grands centres, par exemple. Donc, il faut travailler là-dessus. Et on fait ce travail, on a fait ce travail, on fait ce travail actuellement. Mais on, donc, si euh, la décision est prise, si le Dr. Henry tranche sur cette décision, on est prêt à agir. Et ça, c'est la chose importante. Des, des gens un peu partout dans la province peuvent être assurés, assurés qu'on va agir euh, tout autant que, tout aussi que, que d'autres juridictions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. See you soon.